this video, we'll first look at how video streaming applications work, and then look at the content distribution networks or CDNs that support video streaming. Let's get started. We discuss video streaming and content distribution networks together because the most prominent CDNs are designed to serve video content. So this particular application and the network structure work together. As of this year, the top three video streaming providers, which also operate their own CDNs, account for 80% of residential ISP traffic. There are a couple of high-level challenges in reaching so many users with so much content. One is scalability. The content has to be hosted. The many copies of the videos in question must be served to the users, requiring petabits of bandwidth. And for multiple reasons, we can't do this from a single location, both due to the congestion it would induce in the network and the latency between that one location and many of the users. So a big part of the challenge of CDNs is distributing the content all over the network and connecting to the internet in many locations. The other part of this challenge is the user base. We're talking billions of users, but those users will have different capabilities. Some might be on well-connected wired enterprise networks. Others might be on residential home networks with different bandwidths and levels of service from their providers. And still others might be on a mobile phone network with very small amounts of bandwidth and varying connection rates. So we won't be able to cover every aspect of CDNs, but let's see how the major components work. First, a little bit about video. A video is just a sequence of images and they're displayed at some constant rate. 24 frames per second is typical for cinematic content with 30 frames per second being the typical standard for television content. With online streaming becoming the norm, those conventions are less and less meaningful, but still know that for each video, there is an associated frame rate, which remains constant during the duration of that video. That being said, each frame does not require an equivalent amount of data because it can leverage redundancy from one frame to the next. So some sequences may have a large amount of temporal change between one frame and the next, requiring a greater number of bits to encode it, where another sequence may have a smaller amount of change between frames, thus requiring fewer bits to encode that sequence. So in this slide, we're showing two things. One is an example of spatial coding, where instead of sending the full data for every pixel, it's able to send the full data for one pixel and the number of times to repeat that pixel. This is typically computed in terms of blocks. And you may have seen the artifacts of this if viewing a video over low bandwidth where those blocks become larger and more noticeable. The second part of the example is showing temporal coding where only the changes between one frame and the next are sent, not the complete second frame. A video can be encoded either in constant bitrate, with each frame being allowed the same amount of bandwidth, or in variable bitrate, with frames being allowed to use more or less bits depending on the amount of new information that needs to be sent. All common video standards, starting with the MPEG-2 DVD standard, use variable encoding. The average coding rates may vary depending on either the bandwidth available or the media in question. For example, a Blu-ray disc will use MPEG-4 but encoded at a much higher bitrate than a streaming video. And over time, new compression standards have also been developed that allow comparable quality to be achieved with fewer numbers of bits. So it's important to keep in mind that both the bitrate and the compression algorithm are significant factors in determining the viewing quality of a particular video. So now we have a little bit of background on how videos are encoded. So let's look at how this works as a network application. We know that since the internet provides a best effort service with no reservations, our available bandwidth is going to vary over time while our streaming application is running. There are a few different ways that the network and application can address this issue. So we can think about how the video is recorded with new frames being stored 30 times per second in this example. And this recording is then stored on a server for some indefinite period of time. When the client requests to stream this video, the server will start sending it out. One option would be to send the entire file to the client and then let the client play it back later. However, there are a number of reasons which we'll get into later why this is not desirable. The most obvious is that the client would have to wait for a long time and people don't tend to be that patient. So while the video can be sent out at approximately the same rate that it was recorded, there will be some delay in the network before it arrives at the client, and then the client can start playing it back again at the same rate that it was recorded. So at any given point in time, the client is playing back an earlier part of the video than what the server is sending out. The constraint of the system is that once the client starts playing back the video, the server in combination with the network has to be able to keep up supplying additional frames of the video for the client to play. Otherwise, the client would run out of frames and stop playback. Since the network delays are a variable part of this, as we saw with queuing delay, this means that the client needs to maintain some buffer of frames so that when the network slows down, the client has stored frames to play, and then hopefully the network will speed back up and refill the buffer. The challenge here is that the larger the buffer is that the client decides to maintain, the longer the user will have to wait before video playback can start. 
Features like pausing and fast forwarding and rewinding also cause the need for rebuffering on the client and are an additional challenge for this system to accommodate. So here we again have our transmission of video frames from the server over the network. However, this time we're showing the more realistic case where the network delays are variable. Some frames will arrive at the client's buffer closer together and some will arrive further apart. The client will need to estimate a delay for buffering whereby it thinks it can play back at the original rate without having to stop and wait for more frames. This is how the client software accommodates variable delays in the network. As you might have guessed, there's an application protocol for this, known as DASH, which stands for Dynamic Adaptive Streaming over HTTP. And in practice these days, the video streaming all occurs over HTTPS. So for this to work, the server needs to store multiple copies of the video file and encode them at different bit rates. The client is then provided with the URLs for these different chunks and different bit rates. As the file is being streamed to the client, it can measure the rate at which it is receiving data and request higher or lower bit rates for future chunks as appropriate. The client software, of course, wants to show the best quality to the user that their network connection can support, except in cases where the user may have selected a lower quality in order to save on their bandwidth. Note that much of the intelligence for this process has been stored in the client, and this is part of what improves the scalability of the system. If that intelligence had to be centralized with the server computing this information for all clients, it would have more trouble scaling. So the client determines when to request the next chunk, what bit rate it should request for the next chunk, and it may also have multiple server options to request it from. And that gets us to talking about CDNs, which is a system of having the same content stored in many different places and deciding which location a given client should connect to. So the content distribution is solving this challenge of how to provide a large variety of content to many users distributed all over the world. As we've already said, a single large server is not a scalable solution to this, both from the standpoint of being a single point of failure and from the standpoint of needing to concentrate all of the requests in one place in the network and deal with the resulting congestion issues and latency between that one server and the parts of the internet that are far from it. So no matter how you look at it, this is not a scalable solution. So instead, we'll use many servers and many copies of the content distributed onto those servers and put those servers all over the internet. So the CDN servers themselves get distributed to be close to the clients that might connect to them. For example, with Netflix, if you're on a major ISP, you're probably connecting to a server within your ISP that has a copy of the content you want to stream. As we can see with this Akamai example, this results in hundreds of thousands of servers distributed all over the internet. For a smaller CDN, they may not have the resources to put so many servers directly in access networks, but may put them in a smaller number of data centers located close to access networks. So let's look at an example. In this case, we're talking about the Netflix CDN and the multiple copies that it will store of any given show or movie and distribute those around the network. So when a given client chooses to view that movie, the CDN is going to direct that client to a nearby copy. It can then start requesting the chunks in the appropriate bit rate. Here we see the manifest file being sent and the client requesting a copy from one of the nearby servers. If the performance on that network path turns out to be poor, the client may be redirected to another location. This process can also be used to compensate for changing load on the servers themselves. We can think of the CDN as being an overlay network existing over the top of the internet infrastructure. So the overlay network doesn't need to know the details of the underlying network, but uses performance metrics to determine how to function as an overlay. There are a number of questions that the CDN has to answer, including how to deal with congestion, where to direct a particular client to retrieve the content, how to distribute the content, and so on. A big part of how the CDN solves some of these issues is by manipulating DNS. So let's see how that might work. In this case, Bob is browsing the NetCinema website and picks out a video to watch. The website supplies a URL for that particular video. When Bob goes to look up the DNS for that URL, it turns out that it's a CNAME and Bob gets redirected to King CDN. The DNS server can then go to King CDN's authoritative DNS to find out an IP address corresponding to this URL. And Bob is then able to request the actual video file from the King CDN server via its IP address. This redirection gives the CDN the opportunity to decide which DNS record to give Bob back based on what it knows about Bob, namely his IP address, which can probably be mapped to some approximation of Bob's location. Let's add a little detail on top of this example. 
So now we're looking at Netflix, which uses a combination of the Amazon Cloud or AWS and its own CDN. Netflix pushes copies of its content out from AWS to its CDN servers. Bob talks to Netflix servers on their website, but when he's browsing videos, he's actually interacting with Amazon's cloud. And this is where Bob's client gets the manifest files with further details about where to request chunks of videos. Then when the client goes to look up those domain names, it gets redirected to a particular CDN server. And if all goes well, that server is close to Bob with a fast connection. That completes our overview of video streaming and CDNs. Next time, we'll look at socket programming on TCP and UDP. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.